Hello everyone, this is Grace. It is March the 22nd, 2024, and we are continuing our study on the Passover. We're looking at the Feast of Unleavened Bread in this study. And I had to go back one scripture. <laughs> I had to go back one because I realized that the previous scripture was in John 6 also. So, John 6. Let's go ahead and get started. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into the mountain, into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was nigh. And then we went down. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to, to them that were sat down and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. So he's feeding them regular bread and he's feeding them fishes during the time of the Passover. So let's go on. So let's do some reading here. We'll just start from the beginning here. The day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none, none other boat there, save the one wherein his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples. I'm sorry, okay. Let me just tell you what happened. Um, the disciples left on a boat first. And then Jesus, this is where Jesus walked on the water, and he came over by himself. Okay, so, the day following, when the people which stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was none other boat there, save the one wherein his disciples were entered, and that Jesus went not with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples were gone away alone, howbeit there came other boats from Tiberias, nigh unto the place where they did eat bread, after that the Lord had given thanks. When the people therefore saw that Jesus was not there, neither his disciples, they also took shipping and came to Capernaum seeking for Jesus. And when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Rabbi, whence came thou hither? Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me not because you saw the miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and were filled. Labor not for the meat which perishes, but the meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him, for him has God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? Jesus answered and said unto them, This is the work of God, that ye believe on him, whom he has sent. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What doest thou work? So now we're going to get to talking about bread. Our fathers, well, let's reread the previous sentence. They said therefore unto him, What sign showest thou then, that we may see and believe thee? What do, dost thou work? Our fathers did eat manna in the desert. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not that bread from heaven, but my Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he which cometh down from heaven, and giveth life to the world. He's speaking of himself. Then said they unto him, Lord, evermore give us this bread. And Jesus said unto them, and I, this, is, this was made up, so I marked it um, to remind myself. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. He didn't say that. We're going to jump down here. Jesus said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto you, and the way the way it should have read was, he said this, and then it stops, and then he you come back up here, and it picks up here, and then it starts again, <laughs> and that's that's what was said. 
Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me has everlasting life. I am, I am that bread of life. Your father did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven, that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. Now we don't need this, but I'll read a few verses so you can see. But I say unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not. And that the Father giveth, I said unto you, that ye also have seen me, and believe not. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. So, that's enough. Here we have, my point of putting this in here, was that this is the Passover feast. <laughs> they all ate regular bread. They're all gathered for the Passover. 5,000 men. They all ate regular bread during the week of the Passover. And they say to him, our fathers ate manna. <clears throat> and hold on what is that our fathers did eat manna in the desert as it is written he gave them bread from heaven to eat and they used the word bread 740 there's no mention of unleavened bread at all Food composed of flour mixed with water and baked. Food of any kind. Bread as raised or a loaf. The showbread. When they talk about manna, they talk about bread. Regular bread. Not unleavened bread. There's a word for flour. In the Old Testament, I didn't check the New Testament, but I imagine there is. There's a word for loaf in the New Testament for sure because we're going to look at it in first. um it's, I can't remember. First Corinthians. Anyway, <clears throat> they didn't have to use red, raised bread for this, for this word to describe manna. They just didn't. They used it because that's the best way to describe it as raised bread. <laughs> <clears throat> Jesus said, "Verily, verily, I say unto you, Moses gave you not the bread from heaven, but my Father gave it to you." My Father giveth you the true bread from heaven. <coughs> Hold on, there was some. Excuse me. Hold on, let me pause. Okay. <laughs> okay. Got myself a drink. Hopefully, that'll clear up my itchy throat a little bit. <laughs> So my point that I the reason why I put this in here is because this is during the feast of Passover. They have a whole discussion about leavened bread. And nowhere in this discussion is any of the anyone going to say, "Well, what about unleavened bread? What we keep the feast every week of unleavened bread. It's the feast of unleavened bread now. Are you that unleavened bread?" How does that fit into the equation? He's telling them that he can't. He's the he's the bread of life. Why not say, "Well, we eat unleavened bread." <laughs> if you're the bread of life, what about unleavened bread? No questions whatsoever. No mention of unleavened bread. Do you think that the masses that something like this could really take place and no one mentions it at all? No one mentioned it because it wasn't a thing. It's something they made up afterwards and put in the Bible in order to deceive you. It's impossible to have a whole conversation about leavened bread during the Feast of Unleavened Bread and no one mentions it and it doesn't even cross their mind as a question. Because he would put in these, they would put in these stories where the people were confused. And they had a whole conversation with him about the bread. Leavened bread. 
Unleavened bread, it just wasn't a thing. It's something that was made up. He is the living bread with leaven. Because leaven doesn't have anything to do with good or bad. Leaven is the process of changing you from within. I actually have. I looked up leaven in an old time Bible. Hold on. No, not a Bible. An old time dictionary. Hold on a moment. Okay, I want to show you the definition. This is the dictionary I used. I'll see if I can find the link and post it. They like to take down stuff that I download. They like to go behind me and just take it down real quick. But I'll see if I can find the link. And um, this is the dictionary that I used. The history of the language and an English, an English grammar by Samuel Johnson. Okay. And I would have gotten this from the archives or a link to it some kind of way. But I found these definitions here for ferment, well, fermentation. Not leaven, fermentation. A flow motion of the intestinal, intest, intestine particles of a mixed body. Striving. Usually from the operation of some active acid matter which rarefies, exalts, and fer fertilizes the soft and sulfurous particles. <laughs> As when leaven or yeast rarefies, lightens, and ferments bread or sort. And this motion differs much from that usually called ebullition or effervescence, which is a violent boiling. Oh, wow. So effervescence was an old word for violent boiling. So maybe, I think that's the word they used in the, our dictionary, in Strong's dictionary. Effervescence for boiling <laughs> but they put it was effervescence for fermentation now I'm not going to go back and look it up but maybe if I come across it again that will be good to know <laughs> which is a violent boiling and struggling between an acid and alkali when mixed together No, this isn't just regular boiling though. This is this is something else. Effervescence is not boiling. But it is a chemical reaction as well. It's the struggle 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 between acid and alkali when they're mixed together. Anyway. So there's that. But it's just to show that there's a there's a great deal of um there's a chemical reaction, uh, intestine, internal, inward, not external. Oh, that's it. There's a great deal of uh, commotion that's involved in the fermentation process. And, let's see. I wanted to show you that word. I think it was in the root word or it was in the next one where it said commotion. Oh, we're going to have to really go back. I don't think we're going to be able to find it here.
Okay, well, we're not going to be able to find it. But it was if if I would have looked up unleavened bread and then looked at the next definition, then you would have found words that were similar to that, showing uh, chaos and. Um, it, it might have been instead of the very next word. Hold on. Let's see. Let me get to a stopping point here so we can come back. So let's go to. So unleavened bread. So masta, masta, strife and contention, which fits when you look at the old definition. And we'll go ahead and look at this as well. I don't think. Oh, this just means to milk out, because it's it's talking about how it eats the um, how it eats the sugar, and that's what this is gonna. When we look at the this here, it says that she may suck and be satisfied with the breast of her consolidation, that she may milk out and be delighted with the abundance of her glory. Okay, so let's go back. I'm going to pause you guys while the train passes by. Okay. I don't remember if I needed to say anything else about this. So, we'll just move on. All of that was wrong, by the way. None of this was written by the prophets. They just made all that up. Jesus answered... He it is to whom I shall give a sop when I have sopped, when I have sopped it. And when he had dipped the sop, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon. This is at the Last Supper. At the Last Supper, Jesus is eating with the disciples during the Passover. And he... gives first of all he gives he gives a fragment or a bit a bit of morsel <laughs> a crumb um and it's called a sop this is not a cracker this is not unleavened bread this is regular leavened bread i've seen a lot a lot of deceptions that they have put in the bible this is not a deception it is regular bread that was used during the Passover dinner. It just it's that's what it is. It's regular bread. It was re it's regular bread here and it's regular bread and in, in the last supper. That's far too clever. It's way way beyond what we normally see. Now, in the feast of unleavened now, the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh, which is called the Passover. And here, at the Last Supper, not unleavened bread, but regular bread is used. 740. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it and gave unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. And not a word was said to him about why are we not eating unleavened bread. Not one word. Is that possible? Is that possible that the Lord can hand out leavened bread and no one? These men have been raised up every single year, keeping taking a week out of their life to not only not eat unleavened bread, but to clean it out of their house, throw it out of their house. If they have 
if they have fields of grapes growing, burn it down because there's leaven on it and we can't have it on our lawn. It's repeated over and over. It's put over everything else in the Old Testament. And yet they sit down with the Lord. He breaks regular bread, gives it to them, sops up food with it, and no one says a word about unleavened bread. Not one single reference to it. It's just not possible. It's not possible that they knew anything about this deception. You, you cannot reasonably say that they did. Because there's zero references to it. Let's continue on. And he took bread and gave thanks and break it. And gave unto them saying, This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. It made no sense in the Old Testament. Manna is regular bread. Regular leavened bread. And there's nothing to say it's any different in the New Old Testament. It was regular leavened it was regular leavened bread there too. This is after the Passover. After the Passover, if you still hold on, let's look at our little chart here. If you're wanting to say that instead of eating the unleavened bread the week before at the end of the year, they would eat it at the beginning of the year and they kept the Passover week then. Then why, when he comes back, are they only giving him broiled fish and honeycomb and they know he has to eat unleavened bread? And no mention again. There's no mention at all of it. It wasn't real. It doesn't even appear to be real in the Old Testament. It's just a mockery. The things, the way that it's referenced, the way that it's said, the things that are overlooked because they had to take the Passover out. They had to take that out and put unleavened bread in with no explanation whatsoever. Well, I take that back. They give several explanations. That's one of the reasons why it's so suspicious. <laughs> why do you have so many explanations for eating unleavened bread and all you had to do was say it's commanded for seven days? It was supposed to have been commanded the first day. Why not command it for all of the others? Well, well, because they just, well, because they didn't. <laughs> Your glorifying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump? Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Okay, we need to read the context for this. However, this whole, I don't know if the whole chapter is, uh, is about <laughs> this same thing or not. But I went, had to go all the way back to chapter 1. Let's just go to chapter 1. I didn't highlight everything, but I did highlight a few things. So I might as well look at them. Chapter 1, he's talking about divisions in the church. And he's getting on them about how they are putting, they're worshiping people. They're honored to be around people. And they're giving, um, you know, like for whatever reason, that's my friend or he's rich. And they're honored to have people in their presence. And he's, he's on them about that for several chapters. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. So I only put the ones that were relevant, I guess, to the scriptures that we're reading. Because he's talking about being reborn again. He's talking about being a born again Christian. <laughs> That's all he's talking about. That no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him are ye in Christ Jesus who of God, who of God is made unto unto wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, that according as it is written, he that glorifieth glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. They're glorying in men. I don't really want to read through all of this. Now we have received not the spirit of the word of the world, but the spirit which is 
is of God that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God from the inside the spirit from the inside is working from within us outward to make us a new person which things also we speak not in the words which means wisdom teaches we can't even speak these things in regular in, in regular words but which the Holy Ghost teaches comparing spiritual things with spiritual because it's working from within us a new lump but the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. I really wanted to take us back so, so I could show you that they were out here, um, that what they were doing as far as um, as far as the divisions and promoting one man in honor over another and stuff like that. But I. Mean, I just read through it very quickly, so I just must have marked the things that pertain to the end goal, which we don't really need, but I'll read it anyway. Know you not, know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy, for the temple of God is holy. Which temple are ye? ye temple ye are. So this chapter three. But you did see a hint here in chapter, in chapter three, because at the top it it it, it talks about the divisions in the church. So then we go into four. Let's see if I marked anything in here. And these things, brethren, have I have I have in a figure transferred to myself. Uh, oh, okay. Transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that ye might learn in us not to think of men above which is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. They're taking pride in themselves for menial things, things that aren't godly, and it's causing divisions in the church. So, so to the point where. There's someone in the church that's fornicating. Let's read about it. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication is, is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one of you should have his father's wife. And you are puffed up. They're proud because they're proud to have them in their little clique, in their little faction, and have not rather mourned that he has done these thing, this deed. Mourned that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that when ye are gathered together and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. That should have all just gone together. But to deliver such as want unto Satan, for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. He's talking about the destruction of the flesh. So that the spirit can, can thrive in the day of the Lord Jesus. Then he goes on. Your glorying is not good. They have no right to be proud of this man. They have no right to be proud of their old actions. Because they're supposed to glory in the works of God. And they're glorying in the works of men and they know this is wrong. But they don't care because he's a part of their faction. Your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. He's not talking about leaven. He's talking about this man and his wicked works. How his company is poisoning the group. And on an individual level, it's poisoning the men. It's no small matter. Not to Paul. A little bit of leaven poisons the whole lump. That's what he's saying. It may seem like a little thing, but it's a big thing. It's not small. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that you may be a new lump, 
this is where we have to go into the definitions. So, with old leaven, of course, is going to be the fleshly living. Living by these old ways, tolerating such things as honoring men over the works of God. Or, or I guess you could say, or just bad works in general. That's what he's talking about. Purge out, therefore, the old leaven, that you may become a new lump. This word here is, this word here, B, it's, it's not, it's not, it's, it's that you may either be, it's kind of a general term, where it says you may, it, it's kind of unpresumptuous. It's saying you might be or you might become. That's what it's trying to say. Let's just go ahead and look it up really quick in Scriptures for All. So it's 5600. And look at some of the examples. Okay, I've got them marked right. So, Romans 11 25. Oh, you can't see it. Here are all of the scriptures if you want to look of the uses of the exact same word. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant that you should be ignorant of this mystery that you may be beside yourselves prudent so this is that's not the one you should be ignorant of this mystery lest you should be wise in your own conceit lest you should become or unless you are already wise. See how neutral it is? Unless you are already wise. Or unless you should become wise. Because of your ignorance here. Because of being ignorant. <laughs> now I beseech you brethren. Hold on. That ye may be. You splits. Ye may be yet. Um. Attuned. Okay, so now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you, and that there become no divisions, or if there already are divisions, that there not be divisions, that you may be perfectly joined together, or become perfectly joined together. Hold on a moment. No, that you may be perfectly joined together. That you may become perfectly joined together. That's what that's this is the one that you may become perfectly joined together because there are divisions amongst them. So that you may become perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We'll look at one more really quick. Oh, well, no, because we're at 34 minutes. So let's just get through this really quick. But the point is, is that that word B is it's non presumptuous. It means that you are you already are. Or you are going to become. Now this here, down here, I had to look up as ye are in order to find the meaning of this. And I looked at all of the examples of it. A couple of scriptures that we can look at. Well, let's just look at the definition because I don't want to go into that and we're at 34 minutes. The definition is according as, just as, even as. And some of the um, some of the scriptures you can look at, I only wrote down one. The other word for as ye are was G5618. And that means exactly as or just as. Okay? This is according as. Uh, or in proportion to and this word goes with this one <laughs> because it's in proportion what it's trying to say is purge out therefore the old leaven of bad works 
that you may become a new lump or reborn as you become unleavened. As you purge out that old leaven, it's replaced with the new, the new leaven of Christ and spirituality. And you can see that in the very next sentence. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. This is a sacrifice that you must make. This is the changing from within that you must do. Christ made his sacrifice, your sacrifice is to be reborn. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. There's no bread there. This unleavened doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's supposed to be leaven. With the leaven of sincerity and truth. If you read this sentence and you don't make it leaven, then it just it, it's ridiculous. I'll read it for you again. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, Neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the leaven of sincerity and truth. This doesn't make any sense. They just put this in here to support the Old Testament, the lies that are already in the Old Testament. Okay, so we're at 36 minutes, so we're going to stop there. How many more scriptures do we have? Oh, we got to go because we only have two more scriptures and we're going to get through them hopefully very quickly. Okay. This is in Numbers. I took us back to the Old Testament because I wanted to point something out and this will be quick. So, in Numbers, these are, this is what was offered when the Levites were consecrated into office. And I want you to pay attention to what isn't offered. <laughs> and the Lord said unto Moses, they shall offer their offering, each prince on his day, for the dedication of the altar, and he that offered his offering the first day was Nishan, the son of Aminabad of the tribe of Judah. And his offering was one silver charger, the weight thereof was a hundred and thirty shekels, one silver bowl of seventy shekels, and after the she after the shekel of the sanctuary, this part was made up. They just took this and made it into this. Both of them were full of fine flour mingled with oil for a meat offering. I just just made up. They're not going to put their meat offering into something that was donated. It's just it's, just, it's classless. So, but anyway, they offered flour for a meat offering. This is, by the way, because they made this up. This is why I have to now investigate the meat offering for whatever it was they were doing. I don't know because I I know that they have to have some sort of offering for vegetables. I just don't know why they would have put this in here. Because nobody's going to put their offering in a vessel that you're donating to the church. It just doesn't make sense. It just didn't happen. One spoon of ten shekels of gold full of incense. The incense and the spoon were donated. <laughs> one young bullock, one ram, one lamb of the first year for the burnt offering. One kid of the goats for a sin offering. That didn't happen. and Because there is no such thing as a sin offering. And for a sacrifice of peace offerings, two oxen, five rams, five he goats, five lambs of the first year. This was the offering of the of Nashan, the son of Aminadab. And the rest of them are the same. My point of bringing us here was they made all of these offerings and no one offered flour for the, um, no one offered father flour for the bread. We had already been commanded to take the flour for the showbread from the offerings of the people. So no one would need it to have offered for that. But what about all this unleavened bread that they were supposed to be eating? It didn't happen. So no one cared to offer anything. I just have one more scripture. These are spots in your feast of charity. This is actually a name for the charity, for the, for the feast. For the Passover feast, a feast of love. When they feast with you, feeding themselves with fe without fear, clouds they are without water, carried about of winds, trees whose fruit therein, without fruit, twice dead, plucked up by the roots. Our feast is not a feast of unleavened bread, it's a feast of love. It's a feast of love that includes plenty of leaven, sweet bread, and plenty of celebration 
and none of the affliction which they tried to put upon it. It wasn't there. It's just made up. It just is. All right. I'm going to stop there. I have another study. I have a couple of more studies that I have to do on this topic. But um, we're going to have to wait for those because <laughs> this was enough for me for today. And, well, it took me two days to get it done. But I will talk with you and we'll do, do more on this topic um, in the next video.